How can Jesus be omniscient if he didn't know the hour? That's the question. Not because he does not know, it's because it's not his authority to do so. He only speaks as the Father commands him. What about the angels? Though they're in heaven and they behold God and see God, God hasn't made it known to them nor authorize them to know. But in the case of the Son, though He knows, He hasn't been authorized to make it known. Why? Because the Son says, I only do and speak as I'm commanded, and I only do what the Father does. Now, how do I know that when it comes to Jesus, He's not saying that He doesn't make it known, if that's the meaning, because He doesn't know it. Because the same Gospels that people quote out of context. See, that's Mark 13, 32. That means Mark has written chapters 1 to 12, before he got to Mark 13, right? Yeah. And that's Matthew 24, 36 mentioned there. Matthew has written 23 chapters. That means if you read them in context, and you start at chapter 1, by the time you get to that passage, both Matthew and Mark have already gone out of their way to quote Jesus and show Jesus doing things that only God can say and do. This Jesus is not just a man. He is God in the flesh, the Son of the Father. So they've already established that. So when I come to then Matthew 24, Mark 13, that means they do not expect me to misinterpret that passage to deny all they've said about Jesus in the previous chapters, right? Yeah. I can give you examples of it. I'll just show you Matthew. And she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. The word Jesus in Hebrew, Yeshua, means Yah is salvation, right? Yeah. So now the angel says, why are you going to call him Jesus? You will call him Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. There's not a single verse in the entire Bible or the Quran where someone other than God saves anyone from their sins. Here you're told by the angel in chapter 1, Jesus is being born of the virgin to save his people from their sins. Now you go to Psalm 130, verses 3 to 4, to show that even from chapter 1, Matthew has identified Jesus as Yahweh God in the flesh, not a creature. Psalm 130, verses 3 and 4. If you should keep iniquities, O Yah, if you call men into judgment for their sins, O Lord, who could stand? He'd wipe out everyone. No one is good enough or righteous enough for God not to wipe them out. But with you, there's forgiveness that you may be feared. So here you see, God is saying, though you deserve to be destroyed, he's a God of infinite love, compassion, mercy, does not want to destroy you, but save you. So he extends mercy, which should move you to fear like, wow, this almighty God who can wipe me out, if he wants to, no one can stop him, chooses to love me and be patient with me. So that should move you to deep love respect, fear, and worship of this God. Glory to the Father, Son, and Spirit. All right. If Jesus is a mere man, then he could not save himself, let alone anyone else. But here we're told by the angel that Jesus will come and save his people from their sins. Are we getting this? Here, Psalm 130, 7 to 8. Who saves anyone from their sins? O Israel, wait for Yahweh. For it's Yahweh, there is loving kindness. Be patient on him. He will show you kindness. Don't despair. Don't lose hope. He will come to your aid if you're faithful and crying out to him. And with him is abundant redemption. And it is he who will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. You see it? Yahweh saves his people from their sins. But the angel said, the virgin born son of the Holy Virgin Mary will conceive him without sex. Jesus will save his people from their sins. So if Matthew in chapter one already identifies Jesus as Yahweh in the flesh, doing what the Psalms say only Yahweh can do, save you from your sins, that means Matthew does not expect you to misunderstand Matthew 24, 36. And then watch again, Matthew 1, 22 to 23. Now all this took place in order that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet would be fulfilled saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Well, what does that mean? Which translated means God with us. So Matthew tells you the virgin gives birth to this male child because that male child is Emmanuel. What does that make him? God with us. And if you look at the Greek, it's O Theos with us. Not just God, but the God has come to dwell with us by becoming born as a male child from this holy virgin. So you understand my point? If Matthew has begun by identifying Jesus as Yahweh God in the flesh, then why would you assume that Matthew 24, 36 is meant to deny what Matthew has established throughout the gospel? One more example, Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27. This is the same Matthew, huh? Before you get to Matthew 24, 36. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. Did you catch it? No one knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Now notice a mind-blowing statement that no mere creature can make. Jesus says, he the Son can only be known and comprehended by the Father. He's saying, he the Son can only be comprehended by the Father, and that he alone comprehends the Father in the way the Father comprehends Him. Now, please focus on the implication. Who does Jesus think He is to say, only the Father can know and comprehend me, and I alone comprehend and know the Father, 
and no one else, which is why you need me to make the Father known, because what Jesus is saying here is, it takes an infinite mind to comprehend me. Since the Father is God, omniscient, he alone can comprehend me, and he alone truly knows me. Who does he think he is? Only someone who thinks he's incomprehensible can make this assertion. No one can comprehend and know me truly except God. And no one can truly comprehend no God except me, which is why you need me to reveal him. So he just claimed to be incomprehensible and omniscient because he knows the Father the way the Father knows him. He alone knows the Father, just like the Father alone knows him, which is why you need the Son. So now I'm going to ask you a question. If the Son knows the Father to the same extent that the Father knows him, and the Father has perfect comprehension of the Son, he knows everything about the Son, and likewise, the Son knows everything about the Father, it's reciprocal. That means the Father would know every thought of the Son, right? Every thought of the Son, the Father already knows, correct? So the Father knows every thought the Son has. But the Son says he knows the Father the way the Father knows him. So if the Father knows every thought of the Son, and the Son knows the Father in that same way, that means the Son knows every thought of the Father. Well, now we got a problem. One of the thoughts of the Father is his knowledge of the dare hour. So if the Son knows the Father exhaustively, the way the Father knows the Son exhaustively, and the Father knows all the thoughts of the Son, and the Son knows all the thoughts of the Father, then this passage shows that Jesus must know the dare hour if he knows the Father to the same extent the Father knows him which buries Muhammad in the Quran and shows, even in Matthew, Jesus is the divine Son of God equal to the Father. Do you understand? That's how you do exegesis. Today's passage has to do with Mark 13, 32. Again, it's Mark 13, 32. And it reads, But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. David, doesn't this really mean that Jesus, who is God, doesn't know the future. Well, that would be, uh, if you just read this verse and you had nothing else to go on, right? Then you, you, could, you could make that click, right? But, but we read verses in the context of everything else, right? We read the context, but even ignoring the context, right? even ignoring the context of everything else Jesus said, just reading this verse, you already see some problems for people who are using it. So Muslims use this and say, okay, you're saying Jesus is God. Well, one of God's attributes is omniscience. He knows everything. But Jesus right here says, there's something he doesn't know. He doesn't know that he doesn't know the time of that hour, right? The, the, the time of the judgment. So he doesn't know that sort of thing. So concerning that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the son, but only the father. So this undermines Christian theology. Jesus is not all knowing. If he's not all knowing, then he's not God. And so this supposedly undermines our position. Now, uh, again, even if we ignore everything else, Sam's about to go to some other scriptures. But if we just look at this verse, we can already see some problems for Islam. Notice what you have here, nor the son. You have a son here. Yeah, and it's it's not just any son. It's not That's just right. it's not just the generic sense in which we're all children of God, or which Jews were children of God in a certain sense, or which Christians are are, are children of God in, in a certain sense. There is the Son, right? right? There's the Son and the Father. And look at the location of the Son. Yeah. yeah. So there's the Son and the Father. Now either one of these, either one of these would refute Islam. So if Jesus actually said these words, then he's not a Muslim prophet. Islam is false. Right? Yeah, because they accept him as a yeah, son. Yeah, because if, if he said this and it's true, then Islam is false because this contradicts Islam, right? Or if he said it and it's false, then he's a false prophet and Islam is false because it's, it's affirming him as a prophet, in which case he wouldn't be a, a true prophet. So if Jesus said these words, Islam is already false. So when Muslims quote this, sorry guys, if you're saying Jesus made this claim, then you're telling us that, that Islam is false. So that's, that's one problem. But, but also notice Jesus sets up a kind of hierarchy here, right? He says concerning that day or that hour, no one knows. This, this part's referring to human beings. No one knows, right? No one knows. Then he, then he goes on, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, which is next, but only the Father. Correct. So if you look at what he says, right? It's no human being knows, not even the angels in heaven know. And then he says, not even the Son, right? So human beings and angels, those are all the intelligent beings there are, right? Those are, so... Creation, yeah. If he's over, those are all the intelligent beings in creation. So if Jesus is over all of them in this hierarchy, that's right. People don't know. Angels don't know. Not even the sun knows. So somehow Jesus is already over all of creation in this hierarchy. But Muslims would say, well, he's, he's still not God. And notice, I would say, when he says this, right? If you take sort of a chronology of the Christ, the chronology of the Christ, you have his eternal nature, and then you have the incarnation. Jesus says this in his incarnate, incarnate state, right? right? So in even in his incarnate state, he's still over all of creation, Correct. and yet is still subordinate to the Father. 
So, yeah. is there a way to, it, once we go outside Hebrews, of the script, yeah. book of Hebrews confirm what you just said, because to whom of the angels did he say, you, you are, my, are my son, today yeah. I've begotten you? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's talking about his messianic role, so that's further confirmation of his incarnation. This is what we Christians have to overemphasize. We don't believe Jesus is simply God. He's the God-man. He became flesh. He became a genuine human being, experiencing genuine human limitations. So he's like us in every way with the exception of sin. So to say that Jesus as a man with a human mind and a human consciousness would know everything means he's not truly human. A true human being cannot know everything. So he shares in our humanity so that in respect to his human nature, in his respect to his human consciousness, it's not possible for him to be omniscient. But he's not just man, he's also God. And he's not just God, he's also man. So you got to take into consideration he's got two natures. How does that work? I don't know. I'm not a God man. But I know that in the person of Christ, you have all the essential attributes of deity united with all the essential attributes of humanity, but they still remain distinct and united in one person. And in his human consciousness, as the servant of the Father, he can only recall, retain, know what the Father wants him to know. Because the same Gospel of Mark, let me just real quickly, Mark 10, 45, here's the role that Jesus assumed on earth. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, so he comes as a servant, a servant of the Father, to serve us and redeem us, to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, why is that important? You go to John 15, 15, notice what our Lord says about servants and their relationship to masters. He says to the disciples, I, I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's will, his business. You catch it? A servant only knows what the master wants him to know. So Jesus assumes the role of a servant. In his human consciousness, he can only retain what the Father wants him to retain, though that omniscience is embedded in his divine mind. To prove that he is omniscient also, because he's God, all you need to do is, don't start at Mark <clears throat> chapter 13. Remember, Mark has already said a lot about Jesus Correct. in the preceding chapters. So let's just go for the sake of time. Right. Let's look at Mark 2. Yep. 5 to 12. The context is a group of individuals bring a paralytic to Jesus to be healed. Notice what our Lord says and does to demonstrate He has this power, a power that only God has. Mark 2, I'll start at verse 5. Now, when Jesus saw their faith, He said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. Now, notice the reaction of the people. Now, some te teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? As an interesting side note, if you go to chapter 3, verse 135 of the Quran, it says the same thing. Who can forgive sins except Allah? Same thing. Correct. Now, what does our Lord, what does He not do? He doesn't say, no, guys, you don't understand. I'm not forgiving sins. I'm just announcing that God forgave His sins. Watch. Immediately, Jesus knew in His spirit, and I take that to mean in His divine nature. Mark is saying that in His divine nature, He knew this immediately. What did He know immediately? Immediately, Jesus knew in His spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. So He knew what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. Now it's easy for me to say you're forgiven, but to heal your paralysis, that's something that if I'm a fake, I can't do and get away with. And now watch what he says. But I want you to know that you may know that the son of man, Jesus, has authority on earth to forgive sins. And so he says to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. And immediately he got up and walked. So notice three things Jesus did. Forgave sins, knew what they're thinking in their hearts, immediately knew that's this, right. and healed the man's disease. Let me just read one passage for the sake of time. healed him by speaking to him. Psalm 103, 2 to 4, watch this. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Psalm 103, 2 to 4. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and for, forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Jesus forgave the man his sins, healed his disease, and in Mark 10, 45, he says he redeems our life from the pit. And then elsewhere in 1 Kings 8, 39, we are told, no one knows the hearts of the sons of men except God. And yet it says Jesus immediately knew what they were thinking in their hearts. That's right. Could Mark be any clearer that Jesus and is omniscient, that Jesus has the power to forgive sins, which is something God, can, God alone can do, and he heals diseases to prove that he can forgive sins and has access to our thoughts. What else does Mark need to do That's right. and also, to demonstrate that? The, the Pharisees who were saying this, it wasn't just one person. It was more than one person. Yes. Yeah. So now, now we follow what we call a total scripture, the term all of scripture. I stay with Mark because typically what Muslims like to do if I go outside of Mark, oh, well, see, that's Paul. Yeah. Mark doesn't agree with Paul. I wanted to first prove my case for Mark, but now here's corroborating evidence from John that Jesus is omniscient. In John 16, I won't read all of it for the sake of time, Verses 25, 31, Jesus says in John 16, 25, 31, he's now speaking plainly, not figuratively. Speaking plainly, not par parables. And he speaks plainly, clear as day. When he finishes talking to them, verses 29 and 31 of John 16, notice what the disciples say. Then Jesus' disciples said, now you are speaking clearly without figures of speech. Plain language. Now we can see that you know all things and that you don't even need to have anyone ask you questions. What they mean is, usually I'll ask a question to test your knowledge. Do you really know yourself? 
Well, how do you answer this? We don't need to do that anymore. You've convinced us you know all things. Now, if Jesus didn't know all things, he should have rebuked them. Now, notice what he says. This makes us believe that you came from God. Jesus says, do you now believe? He knows everything. After the resurrection, about two weeks afterwards, <clears throat> three weeks afterwards actually, John 21, 17, the third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. In other words, why are you even asking? Since you know everything, you know whether I love you or not. Before the resurrection, he knows all things. After the resurrection, he knows all things. And according to 1 John 3, 20, he must be God. Because in 1 John 3, 20, we are told, if our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. What else do you need? Well, if he knows everything, what about the hour? That's because as a man uh -huh. functioning in the role of a servant, he can only retain in his human consciousness what the Father wants him to retain. So you, sir, are saying instead of just going with this verse, which might mean multiple things, we're going to look at the rest of what Jesus said. Yes, and Mark and the Bible's own. And we're going to interpret what he says in Amen. light of, yeah. of other things he said. Even after, uh, I think it's interesting in, in, uh, in, in Acts chapter 1, oh, yeah. before the That's Ascension, where they ask him the same question. When, when's this going to happen, Beautiful. right? Beautiful, yeah, Acts 1, uh, 6, so, 7. so he says uh, uh, in Acts uh, 1, 6, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. So there it's not, I don't know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's not, not for you or me. It's, not, it's not for yeah. you to know. So guys, have you ever heard of this, that also Jesus could be alluding to a Jewish custom? Yes. Yeah, we've heard that, yeah. 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 That, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a longer, that's a longer yeah, explanation. Longer but, uh, yeah. Yeah. Not everyone yeah. believes in the seven-year tribulation, and also that's why we went with what we can all accept across right. the board. Yeah. Right. Which is basically, if, yeah, if you approach this like a Muslim, you can, you can, you can get some meaning that, that, would, that would kind of help you, but ultimately destroy Islam, because if you read the verse, it, 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 it would completely undermine Islam right. even more quickly than it would attempt to undermine yeah. Christian theology. But as soon as you start, you know, looking at it in the light of the rest of Scripture, where Jesus is not just God, he's the God-man who we became We have to emphasize incarnate. that. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And, you, and, you, and you look at that and start taking seriously the, the doctrines, you know, if, if they're, you know, you mentioned Paul and stuff, but if they take seriously what Paul says in, in Philippians 2, then you start seeing how all of this fits together. Yeah. But, but for some reason, even when we're saying, even when we're saying all of this, the Muslims still just have a problem with the idea of these eternal God attributes somehow being combined with something physical where it doesn't make sense to say it of the, of the, of the, the, the physical. But we, we point this out in a, in a different context where we talk about, where we answer the question, how can God die, right? Yeah. When we right. answer the question, how could God die? Right. But we point out that in Islam, there is a yeah. sim, there's an analogous concept, namely that if you ask a, a Muslim who knows anything about Islam, whether the Quran is eternal and incorruptible yeah. and, it, of course it is, according to Islam. You're regarded as a heretic if you think that the Quran has a beginning or that the eternal Quran can be corrupted or changed or something like that. And so Muslims believe in something that is eternal, and yet they believe in that something that is eternal entering our creation right. and being either in someone's you know, mind, being written in someone's mind or heart, or being put in a, in a physical form as a physical Quran. Now, if Muslims think it's a problem, to say of the incarnate God man, oh, he can die, or he can say that he doesn't know this. If they think that's a problem, that's right. that, you, that, that you, you can't combine these eternal attributes with things that don't have those same attributes, then they need to reject Islam that's because right. the eternal Quran has no beginning. This, this Quran has Arabic. a beginning, 2015. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this particular, this Quran right here has a beginning, 2015. As far as it being written down into the world at all, it had a beginning. This will eventually fall apart. They don't believe that when this book falls apart, the eternal Quran has fallen apart. If every Quran in the world fell apart so that it no longer existed in this world, That's they right. would say that this hasn't impacted the eternal Quran in the slightest. So this book can be, this Quran can be destroyed. They wouldn't yeah. say that means that the eternal Quran has been destroyed. So what sense would it make to say, Oh, the Quran has been destroyed. Well, it depends on what you mean. If from an Islamic perspective, if you're saying the eternal Quran has been destroyed, that would make no sense. If you said, oh, I took this Quran and burned it and that therefore it was destroyed, they point. would say, oh, it makes sense because now you're not talking about just about the eternal Quran, you're talking about the incarnate Quran, yeah, right? right? The Quran that has taken on a physical form. And once it's taken on a physical form, now it doesn't just have the the eternal attributes, it has the physical attributes. And so you can speak of, of it having these attributes and we would say the same thing I know about Jesus. We want to try to keep it short, but I have to add to this because it's going to be a perfect analogy with the incarnation. The Muslims believe that this Quran is a replica of what's in the mother of the book, chapter 43, verses three and four. This is an Arabic Quran that's in the mother of the book. So this is the perfect replica of what's in heaven. You ask a Muslim, aren't there abrogated verses that have been removed from the Quran? They'll say yes. But are those abrogated verses in the heavenly exemplar? Yes, that means they're admitting that this Quran, though a perfect replica and truly 
100% the speech of Allah, doesn't retain all the information that the heavenly one does. Uh oh. Sure sounds like <laughs> that the earthly Quran doesn't know everything that its heavenly counterpart right. does. So That's if it's right. a problem for Jesus, it's a problem for the Quran. Yeah. And if they're going to say That's it's a not a problem argument. for them, they can't say it's a problem for Thank us. So much. Well, guys, as always, it's great argument and great refutation of that argument. And hopefully our friends who are watching, you know, will benefit from this. And if you're a Muslim who is watching this, I hope that whatever was raised today concerning this particular passage in Mark 13:32 is beneficial. You will take it the way we explained it, not necessarily out of context, but within its context. Of course, you can always go and watch all of these videos at our YouTube channel, Sierra International, at David Wood's YouTube channel, Act 17 Apologetics. And Sam, do you, yeah. ha you have your own, right? I'm building it up, so pray for me. It's Shamunian. My last name is Shamun, I-N. And Lord willing, I'll try to download these as well. So pray for my success to Amen. be used of God, to glorify Him, and God bless you all. Thank you. Until we meet again, have a blessed day.